This is Twit. We have Dr. Leslie Dewan with us. She is the co-founder and CEO of a company. You started it, right? I did, yeah. Called Transatomic. Uh, you're a startup that uh, looks to offer clean, safe, affordable nuclear power. We don't usually think of nuclear power as clean, safe, and affordable, though. What we want to do ultimately is make the type of nuclear reactor that people could plausibly want to have in their backyards, or even, or nuclear reactors that people would want to have in their communities, reactors that can play nice in a grid that has a lot of solar and wind and storage and just figure out better ways of making carbon-free electricity. Com countries like Germany are phasing out nuclear. Yeah. What is the design? Why would you want to phase in nuclear? In fact, uh, one of our visitors is actually uh, working for a Canadian power company that's building a nuclear power plant. Yeah. Why would you want to use nuclear energy? What are the advantages? So nuclear is really good at producing very large amounts of baseload carbon-free electricity. So um, just always on constant carbon-free electricity. Like even in the U.S. right now, it produces um, just about two-thirds of our emissions-free electricity. And, you know, there's some countries that are phasing out nuclear power. Um, there have been a lot of shutdowns of U.S. reactors over the past few years. These are older um, reactors, of course. Yeah, a lot of yeah. the older generation of reactors yeah. that are now around 40 years old. Um, Switzerland is phasing it out. Germany is phasing it out as well. But countries like China are starting massive build programs of new types of nuclear reactors, like both building up sort of the conventional, like, older generation light water reactor technology and also putting in a lot of money into new advanced reactor tech. Um, like right now in the U.S., there are 99 operating nuclear power reactors. Um, in China, I think there are around 40, 44 that are operating right now, and then plans for uh, another 40 or 50 in the coming decades. So would a large your, number under construction as well. Would your plan to be to stay in the United States or go to a place like China that's building more quickly? We want to focus on the U.S. market first, and again, this is still in the in the multi-decade timescales before we'd be able to bring something like this to fruition. But we see a lot of the market being in the U.S. as this country shuts down its existing coal power plants. We want to have a new type of nuclear technology that can fill that gap um, within the electric grid in the future. Um, but more broadly, like so much of the market is in um, the parts of the world that are developing really rapidly and increasing their electricity needs really rapidly. So in China and in India and in Brazil are enormous markets for so new types of We've seen power. horrific pollution in Delhi, we've seen horrific pollution in China because of coal-powered plants. Mm -hmm. So this would be less of an environmental impact. And your plants are safer and cleaner than these 40-year-old plants were decommissioning, right? Yeah, that was one of the main things that we were focusing on when we started the company. So my co-founder and I, we both became nuclear engineers because we're environmentalists. And we feel that if you can make a better form of nuclear power, one that addresses the existing issues of safety and waste and proliferation and cost, then you'd be able to do something that's that's really good for the world in producing large amounts of emissions-free electricity. Right, um, right. So the particular technology that we're working on, we figured out a way so that it produces less than half of the waste of the existing light water reactors that are the majority of the world's fleet today. And um, it has some tremendous safety benefits as well. So when we were talking earlier, you, I mean, you started this company while you, right before you got your PhD, yeah. and uh, instead of becoming a physicist, but you have, this is old technology, right? I mean, this isn't some, this is something that has been around, but not brought to true fruition. Like you're talking about, you've talked to like 60, 70 year olds in the lab who came up with some of these ideas. Exactly. Yeah. And that's one of the things that makes me so excited about it. So the, the genesis of this technology, um, it came about in the 1950s and 1960s. So they, um, primarily researchers at the Oak Ridge National Lab in Tennessee, came up with a design for a liquid-fueled reactor. So it used liquid, uh, molten salts, actually, as fuel rather than the solid uranium oxide fuel rods of traditional reactors today. And that gives it some fantastic safety benefits. So they, they built a prototype um, at Oak Ridge in the 1960s. They operated it for several years. And they showed that this type of reactor effectively couldn't melt down, even in the worst case scenario accident. It was extremely robust. It didn't even have to have any operators on site in order to safely shut itself down. But when they figured this out, this was um, 
in late 1960s, early 1970s, it was before there had been any significant nuclear accidents. This design back then was experimental. It was expected to be fairly expensive. It required highly enriched uranium as fuel. And there effectively was a decision made that said like, well, we don't need this safer nuclear reactor. The ones that we have are safe enough. And it got put on the back burner effectively for many decades. And it's only fairly recently that a number of companies, including Transatomic, have started um, pursuing it much more aggressively and figuring out ways to optimize the design. So are you dealing with a lot of fear? I mean, it sounds like it's just that- Yeah, I'm scared. Of the, <laughs> no, no, no. Because of the accidents, we just think, oh, no, 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 that's too yeah, scary. Chernobyl, like, Fukushima. Yeah. Uh, is that what you're island. trying to work against? Just people's just general fear of something that might not actually be true? So I think what makes nuclear accidents tricky, I mean, so if you look at the, you know, at the hard numbers and not to come across as callous, but if you just look at the, you know, the death rates per, per terawatt hour of power produced for different forms of power generation, um, coal is by far the most deadly um, because of coal mining collapses and even not taking into account um, respiratory illnesses mm -hmm. that are caused by coal power pollution. And then right after coal, you have um, deaths from oil power production, natural gas production, um, even with solar and wind. Like I'm a very strong supporter of solar and wind, but you still get deaths, for example, from rooftop solar. Like I guess per terawatt of energy produced, you have about like 0.1 or so deaths. Um, People falling from, off the roof and stalling them? Exactly, yeah. Holy and then cow. similarly with wind turbines. Right. And then nuclear is an order of magnitude safer than that. And so you can look at those numbers and say like, oh, well, of course nuclear is safe. But with a nuclear accident, if there's an accident at one plant, it affects a broader area. And that I think really changes the perception of, of what it means. Um, for, for a nuclear accident. Some of it's just techno panic, reason. though, because of the scary atomic. I guess the other yeah. issue uh, is waste. And, and nuclear waste is poisonous for tens of thousands of years, right? How do you handle the waste issue? The nuclear waste issue, I think, is one of the biggest hurdles that nuclear power has to overcome. And so with our technology, we're able to greatly reduce the amount of waste that's being produced. So we have less than half of the long-lived waste as compared to a conventional reactor. But there's still a lot of research needed to figure out how you can best store that over long periods of time. And there's you know, some progress in the US side with the Yucca Mountain um, facility and the waste isolation pilot plant as well. But I think we can look towards other best practices examples of waste facilities in, um, in Scandinavia in particular. Um, there's some good ways of storing it. There's a deep borehole technology where you um, can drill many kilometers into the ground to isolate the waste that way. So it's it's a solvable problem, and I think that it just needs more um, more attention being paid to it, or just more like more engineers and more and more technical eyes yeah. on it as instead of just a solution saying no we can't do that it's too dangerous and just walking away. It makes sense to have this in your arsenal of power alternatives to coal, to natural gas. Uh, but ultimately, do you see renewables as the long-term future, or is this just a stopgap nuclear power, or do you think this will be hand-in-hand -hand with renewables? I think that there's a lot of room for nuclear to go hand-in-hand -hand with renewables. Like, when I think about the electric grid of the future, I think you want to have a lot of solar, a lot of wind. You need very good forms of storage so you can level out um, what the curves look like. Batteries or some other mm -hmm. means, yeah. Exactly, yeah, or pumped hydro storage right. or something along those lines for grid scale. And I think that there's room for advanced nuclear technologies to be part of the mix. Because, I mean, really, in the years following um, Three Mile Island and uh, following Chernobyl and even to some degree following Fukushima, there was um, a, a quelling, a dying down of research into advanced mm -hmm. nuclear reactors. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of only now that there's a large number of, um, Oh, you know, actually, sorry. So you can you can think about it these ways. So if you look at a graph of the ages of nuclear engineers, it's this really, really bifurcated curve that you can <laughs> see. So you have a lot of nuclear engineers who are in their 70s or 80s who are you know retiring the towards the end research. of their careers. Yes, yeah. who yeah. like originated this field, the who 50s. were there from yeah. the very, very beginning when yeah. you first started having nuclear power. And then there's a gap in the middle with hardly anyone. And then it starts to pick up again. And it's you your have, generation. Yeah, right? So you How have did you, so you're studying MIT. What are you studying 
as a PhD student. You're studying nuclear physics? When I when I was at MIT, I did my undergrad in nuclear engineering and mechanical engineering. And did you just um, run into this? In, I mean, at first, you probably had the same reaction we do. Oh, nuclear power, it's over. When did, when did your mind flip on that? How did that happen? I think a lot of it would be when I came back to grad school, I started talking a lot with my co-founder, and we were we were actually in some of the libraries reading a lot of old documents. Um, this is actually, it was when we were studying for our qualifying exams, and um, we would take like brief breaks from studying for quals, reading nuclear docs in the library, and because um, that way we could take a break without feeling guilty. And, <laughs> I'm still um, learning, right. I'm still reading. <laughs> And we were so struck by the difference in tone in this older set of documents. Like you'd look at reports from the 50s and 60s and there was optimism. Like they were oh, talking yeah. about nuclear powered cars, nuclear powered airplanes, like they had just built nuclear powered submarines. And it was the sense of like blue sky thinking like, right. oh, we'll make, you know, reactors cooled by liquid mercury. Right. We'll make liquid fueled reactors. Or Mr. Fusion as mm -hmm. in Back to the Future, right? Exactly. Yeah. And there was this sense of like, we want we want to be like that. We want yeah. to um, we want to try new things and do new things. And um, the nice the nice thing about the position that that we are in now, and that all of this sort of new generation of nuclear engineers is in now, is that we can take a lot of advances from other fields. We can take the past fifty years of advances in material science. We can take all of the computer codes that exist now right. that they didn't right. have in the 50s and 60s and use it to optimize the design and make it better. So it's like a really, really rich space well, to be working in. You've got containment vessels that are at atmospheric pressure instead of high pressures. You have mm -hmm. to have a big dome. You have, uh, new, well, and we saw some of these pictures of these, these new designs. Mm -hmm. They really look amazing. The salt instead of the enriched fuel rods which eliminate, you don't have to have external power to keep it cool. That was a problem at Fukushima, right? Is it, they couldn't, they were going to get a runaway because they were, had lost power, right? Exactly, yeah. In a lot of the conventional reactors, you need a constant supply of external electric to keep power. It cool. Exactly, so you can keep pumping water over the fuel or right. else it heats up too much and right. has a meltdown. But with the liquid fueled reactors, you, you don't need that. It has totally different awesome. cooling requirements. So where are you now? First of all, one thing I think is interesting, this is open, right? You're not keeping this a secret. You're not doing this in private. This, you're open publishing your, your results. Yeah, we've been moving to open publish um, as much of our work as possible. So we have a few technical white papers out on our website. And then um, also, if you go to the website uh, osti.gov, otzi.gov, you can, osti.gov rather, you can um, see some of the reports that we've worked on in conjunction with the Oak Ridge National Lab that goes into a lot of detail of the 2D and 3D simulations of the core yes. as well. It's if you search uh, transatomic January uh, 2017 or maybe December 2016 was the first paper, and then the most recent one was uh, September of this year. Now, right now, this is funded by grants from the Department of Energy and other places, right? We have some grants that have come in from DOE yeah. and we're also funded by private venture capital. Oh, as so well. you have investors as yeah, well. Yeah, Peter Thiel's Founders Fund no is kidding. um is one of our main investors. How interesting. And what is the time frame for this? I mean when right now you're designing, thinking about it, where do you stand now and how far before we start building these? So it's long time scales here. So we um, right now are focusing on design for a smaller scale prototype facility, sort of validating and one. refining that design. Okay. Well, actually, that's kind of step one. We're also closing out step zero here, basically, if we want to index it that way. Um, so we're doing um, some lab scale tests, uh, a set of that that we're just finishing up now looking at corrosion, because with these these liquid fuels, the molten salt fuels, you. Um, Care really a lot corrosive. about making sure yeah. exactly. Yeah. They're well. They're corrosive. They're also at around 650 degrees Celsius, and they're radioactive at the same time. Great. So yeah, my What's background that? is in nuclear materials engineering, and so it's an interesting. Problem. I bet it's an interesting problem. Yeah. yeah. So um, when you're trying to get funding, I mean, is it is it you're in Silicon Valley where they're like you need to have you know a million followers by next year? Like, I mean, is it difficult to convince them of these long term investments are worthwhile? It was it was really interesting for us when we started doing fundraising for this a few years back because I um, you know I didn't I didn't at the time have much of an entrepreneurial background and I would talk to some companies and they would they would be really enthusiastic about the te about the technology but they'd say like oh this is great we'll fund you like can you have one in six months <laughs> and said so, no like it's going to take ten years it's going to take yeah. fifteen years literally <laughs> yeah. to make this happen and. Um, 
we realized, like, at the time, there were hardly any other nuclear startups, so there weren't very many other, um, like, sorts of existence proofs that we could look at. Mm -hmm. And we said, okay, well, we want to look at what aerospace startups are doing, mm -hmm. because that's kind of similar uh, long timelines, larger dollar amounts, like, big technology pieces. Um, you know, Founders Fund was one of the early investors in SpaceX, and we talked to them. They actually, on their website at the time, they had a picture of the nuclear-powered airplane <laughs> on their site. And we we kind of knew from that, that there might be um, yeah. some, some good connections yeah. there. Well, You're I mean, not alone now. There's over 100 startups in yeah, this field. Now worldwide, um, over 100 advanced nuclear startups. Um, so cool. Collectively, yeah. I think we've... Um, collectively, there's been about $1.6 billion in private capital that have gone into so advanced there's, So there's some worldwide. real sense that this is real, this could be a big thing, and it's something that we should investigate uh, for our energy future along with these other uh, mm -hmm. technologies. Yeah. yeah, it's not bad if Silicon Valley slowed down a little bit. It's nice. I mean, the move fast and break things ethos. Don't break this thing. <laughs> Keep this maybe, thing intact. Yeah, maybe we so when am I going to have a nuclear reactor in my backyard? That's what I want. Yeah. Oh, Six man. months. Or at least, or a car, or a plane. So We have been submarines. It's not that strange. Inside right? the iPhone? Yeah. Or in the uh, iPhone. If we could make one as small as that, <laughs> that would be amazing. Sure you um, could. <laughs> so we want to break ground on the prototype facility in the early 20s, early next decade. Early then, 2020s. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's okay. going to be a long time horizon. Yeah. And then you have to build that, operate that right. for a number of years to collect the data, um, all the while interfacing with the Nuclear Regulatory the Commission to show them that it is working the way that you right. expect it to work and only following that following that, would we be able to build the full-scale facility? This is appropriate. Megawatts this is order. appropriate. Yeah. Uh, you want to do this cautiously, but you have to take the first steps now, or it won't be ready in the 2020s or the 2030s or the 2040s. We need to begin now. I think that's great. So congratulations. <laughs> well done. You're going to be doing, you, 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 are you comfortable doing this for the rest of your life? Because that's what it sounds like. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's just about the most fascinating field to be in because it's it's interesting physics, it's interesting engineering, it's it's neat from a regulatory standpoint too. There's it's a lot you know, of there's a lot of cool pieces that come into involved. it. Years involved, yeah. And then you have to raise money, and and Peter's pretty comfortable with the 2020 time frame. He's not freaking out. <laughs> they're they're good with the time. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so nice to meet you, Dr. Leslie Dewan. She is the co-founder and CEO of Transatomic. What's the website if people want to go? Uh, transatomicpower.com is the website. And is there stuff there that a, that a dummy like me could read and learn, <laughs> learn from? Yes, in yeah. fact, I read it. All. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> really neat. Re I think really exciting. It's so nice to have you back. Thank you for coming by. Thank you so much. Thank Topher. you for having me here. My pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. I want one in my backyard. Or a car would be okay. A submarine? Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, they're the building Ford nuclear... Fusion, which the Ford was, Fusion yeah. literally has Mr. Fusion. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. These are all fission reactors, obviously. Yeah, these are fission yeah, reactors, yeah, sorry. Fission there reactors. was, um, yeah, the Ford Nucleon, rather. Sorry, was there... Um, Imaginary uh, yeah. concept. Uh, yeah. yeah. They but built there a little are nuclear, model of it. There, nuclear submarines have little mini nuclear power plants in them, right? Yep. Is that the old school technology? So they're most similar to the old school technology. Yeah. Um, I mean, the U.S. got nuclear-powered submarines up and running Soon. first. Quick. And then right. it's actually, like, is there another minute or so for yeah. an anecdote? Oh, I'm fantastic. fantastic. <laughs> awesome. Okay. We're, so, we're um, waiting until the 2020s. We're, we're yeah, we got now. lots of time. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so the first nuclear-powered submarine was the USS Nautilus. Um, right. That, I guess, um, was commissioned in 1954, I believe. Okay. And then um, immediately after that, the U.S. wanted to get commercial nuclear power up and running as quickly as possible. And as a point of national pride, the goal was we're going to get this running before the USSR does. Right. And so um, the nuclear-powered submarines, they're perfect, beautiful machines. The reactors in them are optimized for use in a submarine. And so um, to get commercial power up and running on land, the US effectively took this submarine reactor <laughs> put it on land instead of spending another decade or two yeah. optimizing a land-based reactor. Yeah. And it, you know, it works, it works well, they're great yeah. for, you know, So you mean the power plants we see today are based on nuclear power plants from submarines? They, they evolved out of the submarine How reactors. They were developed mm -hmm. first for the yeah. submarines. Of course, they had ample seawater to cool it with. They exactly. Have, yeah, worst case scenario easier. accident in a submarine, you're not going to run right. out of water. But right. one, of the, one of the reasons, to some degree, why the conventional nuclear reactors that are built today are so expensive is that you need um, 
uh, you need all of these backup safety systems. Right. You need um, all of the facilities to ensure that you have um, the right because amount of, of water on site. Because of fuel rods, because of a high pressure and all of the, the different technologies that these nuclear submarines used, we c but we can do it better. Exactly. Yeah, and that's what um, a lot of the advanced reactor companies that's like that's Transatomic that. are doing. Say, all right, we're just going to go back to a much earlier part yeah. of the technology tree and see if we can suss out How something else. So the submarines actually are part of the conversation. That's very mm -hmm. interesting. Right. Yeah.